Let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for coming to our panel today. Uh, my name is Ryan Wilk. Um, I'm the head of customer success for New Data Security. We're, we're part of MasterCard. Um, what we want to talk about today is, is account takeover. Talk about the, uh, the, what the issue is and, and the fight against account takeover within the industry. Um, we have a really great panel today covering some, some vendors, uh, vendors in different areas, um, a, a merchant uh, from Kohl's, um, an FI, uh, JP Morgan Chase. So we're going to get a really wide perspective of how account takeover, how credential testing, and how this overall issue is really affecting the industry at large. So before we get going, what I want to do is I want to let each of the, the panelists introduce themselves. So we'll just go down this way since uh, well, easy to go in order. Okay. Uh, my name is Jad Mikhail. I work for Kohl's. So I am the fraud manager uh, for stra fraud strategy and analytics as well as the operational side for a private label card. Hello, I'm, my name is Ken Wimberly. I work with JP Morgan Chase. Uh, my role is as a cybersecurity architect. I focus in uh, various places, authentication, mobile security, uh, fraud in an area called fraud and protect the client, which is our funded group for um, you know, basically uh, fighting fraud, fighting ATO, as well as um, making people whole that get um, uh, involved in it. Hi guys, I'm Chris Stevens. I head up the analytics team at CallSign. So CallSign embeds analytics into authentication processes to basically understand normal authentication activity for identities. And so we understand the locations that people come from, the devices they use, the behaviors that they exhibit in terms of their typing patterns and mouse movements, all that kind of good stuff. Then they, we also combine that with and the status of, of their authenticators. So we look at whether certain credentials have been compromised, you know, tapping into things like the dark web, looking at static information to see if it, that's available on the users, and then also work with some of the mobile network operators, so the MNOs, to get the status of mobile phones. So has call diverting been set up? Has its SIM swap recently happened? And so you know, based on all that intelligence, we then intelligently adjust the authentication processes based on the level of risk that we've captured. And ultimately, that means it's an improved user experience for the genuine user, whereas attackers face that additional level of friction. And so we do that across kind of two solutions. We work in the enterprise space, so protecting access to physical and virtual desktops, VPNs, SaaS applications, all that kind of good stuff, as well as the consumer side, so e-commerce, banking, gaming, gambling, that kind of stuff. Hi, my name is Madhura Bellani. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Danal. Danal is a global mobile identification and authentication platform. Uh, we work with uh, carriers across the globe. We have coverage in 10 plus countries, work with 30 plus operators to bring unique um, signals from the carriers in real time. And then Danal adds an, another layer of intelligence and behavioral anal analytics on top of it to solve for use cases such as fraud, ID and authentication, and also compliance. Oh, thank you. So, uh, so a really great panel today as far as uh, who we have speaking. So what I'd like to do is open it up chatting a little bit with uh, both, uh, both Jad and uh, Ken talking a little bit more around what the FIs are seeing and what the e-coms are seeing as when it comes to account takeover. Um, you know, what are the risks and, and, and what are you seeing? I'll probably start with you, Jad. Okay. Um, I'm t obviously going to take the retail perspective here and from a merchant side. So, I mean, our goal is to create a, a f as frictionless po uh, experience as possible when trying to log into your shopping profile, which means we want very little interaction from the customer other than username and passwords. Um, so with that, with that, that's where the risk really lies because with all the data breaches, username and passwords are flying all over the place. We don't want to have customers continually change their passwords. We want to have them continually um, authenticate themselves, so everything really needs to be on the back end from our perspective because if we cause too much friction, our customers are going to say, forget this, I'll go somewhere else. Um, so with account takeovers, we see a lot of just customers logging in from different devices, um, through different channels, it could be their mobile phone, their PC, uh, things like that. So as we see that the, just the login attempts and just the, the account harvesting that kind of we'll talk about here shortly, as I, the, that activity just increases, makes it very, very difficult for us to capture that ATO up front as opposed to waiting to the back end after the transaction's already occurred. Oh, great, thanks, Jed. Mm -hmm. so, so Ken, I mean, maybe uh, getting that kind of flip side perspective from the, the mm -hmm. FI industry, kind the of what's the, what's the risk you're seeing? Uh, 
So we, we agree uh, from, a fric from a friction standpoint, we want to keep minimized friction to the customer. But at the same, at the same time, we need to ensure that um, the, the, the identity that they, are, they claim to be is, is accurate, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, so some interesting things that we, we kind of see. Uh, one is the, the fact that uh, username and password have been, has been used for, for you know, two decades now, three decades, and kind of in the, in the common space. Um, and that's given the attackers a long time to develop some really, really good uh, ways of penetrating that area. Uh, so so I, I advocate that we need to really start thinking differently. We just we need to um, you know, move away from that process. Um, I, think there's, I think that we're at a technology tip, tipping point where we can. Um, and I, and I, I believe it's gonna, it's gonna take some, um, some courage and, and you know, some good, good um, momentum, but it, it should happen. Um, so some other things that we're seeing, um, quite honestly, with our old traditional style is uh, we, we, we see that um, crime in the area has, has um, kind of created kind of the, the, a virtual um, uh, organization, shall we say. You know, crime, um, crime syndicates create themselves in a, in a virtual quick fashion. They have each have a, a particular area of expertise. One, area, one, one individual might be very good at harvesting credentials. Another is good at marketing them. Another is good at uh, cracking passwords. And they work together virtually. So what we, what we, what we, what we see is that a, uh, an account will be um, you know, brute, brute forced at some point but it has happened maybe several months in the past before it's actually attacked. Sure. So that, that's, that's one area that we're, and so kind of anticipate, kind of envision that this is, that they're working together, uh, you know, there's different layers of, of, um, of the crime that's happening. Um, the other area is um, that we're seeing quite a bit of now is agri um, robot, robotic attacks with uh, credential stuffing and just massive, massive brute force attacks against our authentication systems. Um, and it's causing tremendous challenges from a, a reliability and resilience standpoint. From a, so from, as a technical, as a technology organization, it's incredibly difficult to fight, keep, continue to fight this. So again, I, I, we, we, I'm a not strong advocate for change. Great. So, so yeah. I guess just one follow-up question. You know, New Data works in the field of, of identifying account takeover, identifying malicious credential stuffing. Um, at least from my perspective, when I look at the data, e-coms and FIs, there's, there's really no difference. Mm -hmm. It's a login, and that login's being attacked. Okay. When I say that to e-commerce merchants that I'm talking to, or I say that to FIs that I'm talking to, they look at me like I have five heads. So I'm just curious right now, with, with your, both of your perspectives, do you see much of a difference between the FI and the e-com world when it comes to uh, account takeover? Is there something unique to it, or, or is it really kind of the same thing? Well, I haven't thought about it that, you know, quite honestly, uh, but I wouldn't look at you with that <laughs> if you had five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, to me, it's, it's a antiquated way to authenticate um, into a system, and there are much better ways, um, and we could all get on board that quickly. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you asked me that question two years ago, I probably would have looked at you with five heads. Uh, but you know, as we've kind of you know learned through you know, device fingerprinting and seeing what devices, um, we we're seeing that same thing because immediately we started tracking that data. We weren't even aware of the extent of you know, the account harvesting or the brute force attacks that we were even seeing. Um, so I think, I mean, I can probably say that we're probably seeing the same thing or mm -hmm. along the same lines. Um, but it, it, it was just amazing to see that once you start seeing data that you've never seen before, uh, of what, how that just changes your strategy and your, your approach to ATOs. You know, and, and from the vendor perspective, you know, that we see much more data traditionally than, than you would see at your individual institution, just because we can bring that data together from many customers we're working with to get that insight. It'd be interesting to hear from, uh, from, from both CallSign and Denial, just kind of the ideas that you have and what you're seeing in the ATO world from that kind of unique uh, uh, position of seeing lots of people's data. Yeah, so I think one of the kind of first areas I'd like to touch upon is the, the cross-channel fraud element. And so you might have one particular channel that you think is well protected, but actually um, by looking across all the channels, you're, you're actually vulnerable. So one of the kind of common fraud MOs is to, you know, first of all, use some of the harvested, harvested credentials that you've mm -hmm. picked up, you know, static credentials, uh, memorable information, 
to, to just log into things like internet banking. And so you go into internet banking and you can view transactions. So you can see who you've paid, when you did it, all this kind of information. And so you, you just stop there. You know, you've, you've, you've got what you need from that channel. And so they then attack the telephony channel. And so the telephony channel now, you can use that information you've collected that you know, off the back of the credentials to then reset certain other information through the telephony channel. So that's kind of one way where, you know, unless you understand the kind of holistic view of a, a, you know, an identity across all the different channels that they can use, um, you're not necessarily going to solve the, solve the fraud problem. Um, I think one of the other areas that we've seen is a move away from compromising the, the first credential that a user has to actually their um, you know, secondary authentication method. So you know, we've seen it in all of the kind of crypto exchange hacks where you know, there's, a, there's a reliance placed on you know, sending one-time pins via SMS, which you know, obviously the NIST now NIST has said you know, it's totally insecure methodology. And it's insecure for a number of different reasons. So, you know, the SS7 telephony protocol itself is underlyingly flawed. So I can, well, sorry, attackers can go in and um, uh, <laughs> view, view messages that are, are, are sent, you know, view the actual codes, and then also have the ability to uh, divert those to, to other numbers. So actually sending codes via that protocol is just you know, unacceptable from a, an authentication perspective. Um, and then also, you know, other vulnerabilities around SMS-based one-time PIN uh, you know, verification is the number of apps that you give access to your messages. You know, how many of those apps are actually malicious and are just going to pull in, pull in those messages that are received? So you know, we've seen that, you know, that used as a, as a way to basically you know, take control of that second factor, which is you know, seemingly secure for the user. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm sure another method which you, you know, you'll talk about uh, in more detail is around, actually, I can go to Verizon and um, you know, pretend to be an individual. And you know, ultimately, the, the Verizon sales rep is incentivized to sell me a new phone. And so I can then take over uh, someone's number by buying a uh, $1,000 iPhone. And it, it, that then means is these second factors, which you, you place in all this reliance on, are suddenly you know, not worth not worth having. Um, so that's kind of the, when a telephony-based approach is, is used. And the, and the other side of things, which I think we're going to see more in the next uh, you know, in, in the next year or so, is once there are controls put in place to protect that telephony channel, is actually the the mobile app-based um, you know, push-based authentication approaches. And you know, what what we're seeing is you know, if you can if you can clone that clone that to actual auth authenticator and take that onto another device you then have also control of that, that second factor. So I think that's some of the different areas where we're seeing moving from that primary credential to actually that second factor that's being used um, within organizations. Um, so um, I know we talked about a lot about the online um, account takeover, but another big channel for account takeover is call centers. Um, you know, just um, to take a quick uh, poll, um, you know, so if I just wanted to sort of to show how much the account, the uh, uh, online account credentials are valued by the fraudsters. So if the fraudsters has three options, they can buy either, say, Citibank creden credentials, buy a stolen credit card, or buy, say, a Fry's account. Which one of those three do you think they'll pay most dollars for? Which account do you think they'll pay, you know, say, $100 for? Or uh, which of these three accounts do you think? So, you know, I was very surprised to see the report that for a Fry's online credential, a fraudster would pay over $100, almost close to $200. This just shows you the value of the, an online account, um, that, uh, an account that has been established, you know, a consumer who has been using that account, how valuable that is for a fraudster. Right? So um, I know we talked about the online account being valuable, right? Um, uh, and targeted for fraudsters to uh, do an account takeover. But the other channel where the uh, fraudsters attack and try to get access to an online credential is through the call center, right? There is a human uh, element to it. There is a customer service rep that they are interacting with that they can sort of put pressure on, you know, go through a, a password reset. Um, uh, flow, right? We all know all the information around KBA is very easily available. 
So go through those KBA checks and then do a password reset, right, through call center channel. Use the online account. You know, one of the examples that you mentioned around retail centers, right? So if, um, if, um, if my um, uh, carrier credentials, right, if I want to take over, create a new account with the carrier, I can go with uh, 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 a fraudulent ID to a retail uh, center with the carriers and create a new account. Um, so um, it's, we are seeing many interesting patterns where um, consumers are, uh, or our clients are adding layers of authentication, right? Carrier authentication is a piece of uh, sort of um, defense that the uh, clients are using. Um, and I'm you know, happy to discuss all the details. And I know um, we talked about SMS being vulnerable. Um, that's definitely, you know, it's, it's interesting how all the, um, you know, a lot of e-commerce as well as financial institutions rely heavily on um, uh, SMS, OTP. And um, there is a more secured alternative solution using the carriers to do a similar kind of authentication through mobile network without using the SMS. Um, and happy to discuss that as we talk about the solutions to combat the ATO fraud. No, great. And, and one of the themes I think I heard around the table, whether it was directly said mm -hmm. or if it was kind of uh, uh, mentioned on the side, is friction. Um, friction is the biggest issue. Uh, we all know that for most of our companies, 99 plus percent of the, the users on there are your good user. You have these spikes of risk, but they're, you, know, you, you need to mitigate them. You know, you, you look at the different environments. You know, e-commerce has always been that, that, that mindset of let's get the conversion and we'll figure out how to clean up the mess later on. You know, the, the FIs in the United States have always been a little bit more open. You know, they have some level of two-factor authentication or some level of, of step up, but generally it's a username and password login. You know, talking to uh, Christopher a little bit earlier, you know, talk, from London and talking about some of the banks in the UK and the United era the, in the European Union, their mentality, at least from what I've always seen, has been let's just throw so much friction in here that, that we make it hard to log in, and then you know we'll we'll ensure it's the correct user. And it's interesting with PSD too how they're starting to now move away from that. You know, even though they need that strong authentication, they're starting to move into a world with a slightly weaker authentication. So it's really that idea of giving your good customers that fantastic experience, keeping them there, making making sure they remain loyal, and ensuring ensuring that the bad actors are mitigated. I guess it'd be interesting to hear from, from, from both of you just kind of what you're seeing in, in your world around how do you ensure your good customers are getting that good experience from authentication downwards while ensuring bad actors aren't, aren't taking over those accounts. Shall I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, so I'm not sure if, if it's um, accurate to say that if, if friction necessarily means um, less strength in, in authentication. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not, it, maybe you weren't implying that, but that might have been something I was hearing. Well, if, if, you, if, you, if you heard it, it would be interesting in at least expanding it on yeah. your side a little bit. So um, it, these days there are ways when you can prove who you are without p using a password. Mm -hmm. right? we, you know, there's various protocols, cha uh, you know, open challenge response, um, organization called FIDO. Um, you know, there's, there's basically I call them cryptographic um, certificate based authentication mm -hmm. and the the reality is it's actually simpler and quite a bit less friction to um, to enable that so um, we you know we were, we definitely want to explore that we think it's, it's better for our customers um, it's certainly a, a nicer experience it's better for the bank you know, from a um, an attack perspective if we can minimize the attack to one device at a time, which is what, it, what cryptogra cryptographic um, certificate-based authentication is, then it's, a, it's an incredibly, um, it's, it's an impossible uh, attack to mount. It's, it's just not scalable. So the, you know, the, the unlucky few who get targeted, well, you know, those are the, they, they have to take more precaution. But for general people, for, for most folks, it would be much more secure and less friction. Yeah, yeah I mean, from a friction standpoint, it's a, it's a tricky word um, in the retail space because you don't want to cause it. So, uh, you know, it's it's a question you have to ask. Like, do you prefer friction up front? I mean, trying to identify somebody to log into their profile, does that cause more friction than having somebody get into the account, make a transaction, and then have to clean up the mess later? Which, which one causes more friction? Uh, so I guess it depends on what side of the camp you're on. Um, from our perspective is we want to make sure our customer experience is smooth our customers across all channels, 
all devices. So it's not uncommon to have, you know, customers have multiple devices attached to them. They can have a PC, they can have a tablet, they can have, you know, a laptop or, or a cell phone. So you have different devices, different, different fingerprints um, for each customer. Um, so for us, is trying to try to identify as we link all these different devices together that the customer has constant access to their their wallet, and their, so they can save all their coupons, their reward points. They can use that both online and in store. So how do we keep all that connected and as a frictionless uh, ex experience as possible? So that kind of definitely creates the challenge for us as we're you know combating account you know, harvesting account takeover because we do see a lot of what you mentioned, Ken, is you know you know fraudsters are out there continually hitting us with you know. Um, with bot attacks or brute force attacks to, to get these accounts seeing does this username and password work on this mm -hmm. profile? If it works, great. And they'll save that. They'll age it like fine wine. And they'll either go out and sell it or they'll wait. And we've seen transactions um, either later in the same day after a login tip is made, or we'll see it several days later, even a month later, where they'll come back in and a fraudulent transaction has occurred. Um, so the balance for us is, is balancing that friction in, in the cell. But I, the challenge for us is I want to be able to know from each one of those devices, who's that device belong to? All right. Is it the actual customer logging in to the and it owns that profile, or is it the, is somebody else trying to log in from a different device into a different profile? So I want to know if Jad is logging into Jad's profile from that device that belongs to me, or is it Ryan's device trying to log into Jad's profile? How do I connect those two? Hey, so, so Ryan, if I were to challenge that question, right, um, one doesn't have to choose between uh, friction, adding friction and add, or adding security, right? A very good example is um, the way uh, the NAL does mobile verification. So um, I know you mentioned the challenges with SMS. Often the second factor of verification, the way it's done is you send an SMS with an OTP, and the OTP could be compromised. It could be, you know, the consumer could be tricked into giving the OTP, right, the, in the SMS. But, and it is, if you think about it, added friction, right? You, you get an SMS, you open it, you enter it in your app, and then complete the transaction or, you know, go through with the transaction. But here, right, uh, with what uh, the mobile verification product that Danal offers, you don't have to go through the step. You don't have to uh, get an SMS, enter the PIN code, enter it in your app. Um, just the fact that you are interacting on your mobile device, uh, the null piggybacks off the connection that uh, the device makes with the carrier and identifies the phone and does the validation. So in this scenario, right, you have removed the friction as well as added the security, yeah. right? No, and I, and I think and new data is doing the same thing. New, new right? data is doing the same thing. I think across the top of our booth it says frictionless verification. So friction is if, frictionless is, is the big buzzword. Um, you know, another one of the, the solutions out there today that, that can provide a level of frictionless authentication is what, what's called passive biometrics. Um, there's quite a few different uh, vendors that offer passive biometrics today. I'll give you a little bit of an, an explanation. I think we're all very familiar with active biometrics. Active biometrics are thing like, things like a fingerprint when you hold your phone in front of your face and it looks at you. Passive biometrics looks to collect the actual input variables into the device. So things like typing speed, keystroke deviation, are you holding your mobile device in a left-handed or a right-handed configuration? All of those different real-world input device, uh, variables being collected, analyzed, and then building out profiles around the user. So that each time that user returns, you can say with a degree of confidence, what's the, what's the probability this profile matches the historic profile, giving you that, that added benefit uh, kind of beneath the, the scenes. Question? Yeah, for the uh, retailer and the banks, uh, what type of authenticators are you guys watching or investing in to uh, get away from uh, replayable um, artifacts to authenticate your users and, and customers? Do you want to hear Okay. Um, uh, kind of what Ryan was just saying, so we, we do partner with, with New Data to kind of do that, you know passive and active biometrics to kind of build that profile on the customer. So when someone comes to the website and uses their traditional username and password, we're watching what that customer does and seeing, does that match what this uh, customer has done in the past? Does it match that profile? And we're getting a risk-based assessment based off of that. And as they go through the process, we're watching very, very closely. So do we want to add another level, le level of friction, maybe at the login side? Okay, this person doesn't match. We'll make them do some kind of other other authentication before we let them into the profile. We'll do that again at checkout, just based on what we're watching at each step of the process as they're going through their journey of logging in, shopping, and then checkout. You know, I if I just oh, I'm sorry, if I just jump in there as well. So you know, we've seen a number of banks starting to 
you know, evolve the different authentication or channels that they use. So, for example, starting to use things like Alexa and, and Google Home, where if people are placing orders through those devices rather than going through the, the traditional uh, digital channels. No, absolutely. And I, and I think part of it as well, partly to answer your questions, when you're thinking about the types of interdictions you might want to use, you really want to contextualize the interdiction to what the risk is. So if, it, if it's a human, you would never want to show that human a CAPTCHA. If it's automation, maybe you do want to show that automation a CAPTCHA, but, but, that, but if there's human risk, maybe, sh maybe give them a, a push to mobile, a, and you know, dirty word now, SMS, but you know, mm -hmm. it's one of those types of interdictions that's tuned towards a human, tuned towards the risk. So, so I think it's that, that intelligent friction where you're understanding what is the risk presenting itself, then giving the most appropriate interdiction for that type of risk to mitigate it. Um, I, I, at least that, that's what we've generally found to be quite valuable. And I think actually the answer was hidden in your question, right? <laughs> you said artifacts and replayable, so neither one of those things. If we can get away from artifacts that are static and anything that cannot, that, that can be replayed, should be, should, we should just not use. No, great. Um, you know, kind of, kind of continuing on, uh, question. Yeah. In a, in a passive mode? Yeah. I think so. Um, it would require, co co well, sh you wanna, shall I repeat the question? Or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So is there anything that we can do at the account opening that can baseline the, um, the trust that we have and, and then we can kind of build upon? Yeah, I mean, obviously tenure is something that we believe in strongly and the longer that we can, we have a relationship with a customer, the, the, the more trust we have. Um, but I believe um, you were describing passive. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are um, platform capabilities and mobile devices that can capture pl passive activity. Um, the, I like to use the, the pet dog um, ana analogy. Um, your, your dog knows who you are, right? And I know that your dog knows who you are. Mm -hmm. So if I know that your dog knows you, then I can trust your dog. Um, and I think we can get there te technically. Um, that's my favorite way of describing that, by the way. <laughs> I know my cat doesn't trust me. So, <laughs> so, um, so I just was going to add, um, so uh, many of our clients use mobile signals, mobile attributes as a baselining attribute. Again, in the going with the theme of passive um, data without adding friction for the consumer. What are some of the signals that can be stored that uh, the clients can monitor for changes and based on the changes then potentially step up the authentication or ask for additional information. So SIM ID, SIM ID, device ID, what has been the uh, account tenure, right? What is the porting history? A lot of these attributes get used to do that passive monitoring behind the scene. Now Changing the topic just a little bit, going from uh, kind of the friction and the, the passive piece and kind of talking a little bit more about where does ATO and where does credential testing happen? Um, you know, there's lots of different channels and, and bad actors will look for the channel that you have that doesn't have protection on it. So whether that be your web channel, your native app channel, and, and what I personally feel to be one of the riskiest is your enterprise API channel. Since enterprise APIs are designed to receive automated input, you know, it's a great place to, to script. It's, it's expecting to be scripted. And you know, a lot of traditional tools have a lot of trouble being able to identify what is risk within that automated flow, since you know, most of those tools are designed to say automation block it. So, so, so that's a lot of where I see bad actors attacking nowadays, moving away from the web, moving away from the actual app, and going towards those enterprise APIs. Be interesting just to, to see more of what the panel's seen, and maybe also maybe bringing up a little bit of what you're seeing between the, the human part of account takeover and the kind of the automated part of credential stuff. And I don't know, maybe do you want to start? Uh, yeah. Start? So you know, one of the kind of uh, you know big impact in frauds that we're seeing, particularly in the UK, is around uh, invoice fraud. And so what that basically means is you'll have a number of suppliers as as an SME or a larger enterprise. And you know, ultimately, you trust an email address that you, your, one of your affiliates or your suppliers you know, 
communicates with. And so if that email address is being compromised, so one of your suppliers is being compromised, you know, that they'll then, you know, that might be done through an automated fashion testing credentials. Um, but once they're into that email address, they'll then understand how that supplier interacts with the, the business. And so they'll, you know, they'll harvest information in terms of like, holidays that people are going on, how, how they sign off their emails and, and the language that they use. And then they'll use that to go in and, and, and you know, say, OK, you know, we've just, it's the end of the month here. We've just changed our bank. Uh, this is our new, our new account to, to basically make the payments to. And so you're basically at the mercy of the, you know, the, your affiliate in terms of their, their email address being hacked. And you know, you, they, you know, they'll obviously do all the kind of persuade, you know, sounds all normal. And so you'll update the, the, the pay details and suddenly you're paying invoices to a, a whole new bank account. So that's a very kind of hard one to, to protect against. And what you need to actually do is ensure that you know, that email is actually coming from that, from that genuine uh, you know, person there. So you know, it's, it's definitely a, a challenge to think about you know, not only trusting your controls, but the controls of, of your, um, your suppliers and affiliates. Jad, any, any thoughts from your side? Um, I was, I was thinking just, you know, the ATO and how it just, you know, evolved over time. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, trying to get into the profile and the bot text and everything, but um, there, there are a lot of ways that you can, you know, take over an account. And one thing that we're kind of seeing from, from the human side is I'll have a, an email address, so to speak. I can actually, you know, contact the call center. So you were talking about the call center earlier. Is I can just call into the call center, say, hey, I need my password change and this email address. They'll send out a new password mm -hmm. immediately. Boom, I've lost that profile to that to that froster. So the challenge for us is, is how do we protect our customers from things like that? How do we authenticate uh, the customer even when they call in yeah. and say, okay, this is who they say they are. I'm going to go ahead and reset the password for that person. Very interesting. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, yeah so um, API, definitely an interesting topic. Um, so we, we look at um, we look at authentication in, in three vectors. One is, you know, is the human who they claim to be? Is the device one that we've recognized before? And the third is, you know, is the application the right application? And and, and an application in terms of AP, API. So some some application out there is invoking a request on on a service, right? So we're actually developing services these days that don't trust anybody. They don't even trust themselves. Um, and they have to be completely self-policing. And that's kind of the attitude that we're taking now is um, you know, every, every uh, request has to have a attestation that is um, cryptographically uh, secure and, and bound to a trusted third party. Um, and there's, you know, there's, Maybe maybe we're going a little bit overboard and over engineering. We'll we'll find out, but it's it's the view that we're taking, especially as we as 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 industries and uh, enterprises move to the cloud, they you know, they really need to protect their API. And um, so, we'll, we're we're uh, actually doing some interesting sp things in that space to to ensure that the application that's coming in re invoking the request is a trusted application. Absolutely. Any, any thoughts from no, I think we covered it. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think, uh, you know, when we're talking about channels, another interesting thing that, that at least new data sees, and I'd, I'd be interested to see if, if the panel sees this at all, is when bad actors are writing these scripts to try to take over accounts, they're, they're relatively basic. You can Google how to write a script, and you can even get pretty complex scripts that you can just set up quite easily with a couple clicks. Um, that said, with a lot of complex tools that these you know, e-coms and banks are using today, they're able to very easily identify those types of malicious scripts. They stand out kind of like a sore thumb. What we're seeing that bad actors are doing is they're starting to take a different tactic. They're starting to go after tools that, that, that we call aggregators. So whether that in, in the financial industry be things like uh, you know, Mint, Yodli, those types of tools where you give them your credentials and then those could, they go and they aggregate banking details. There's some in the, the e-com world, there's, there's rewards points aggregators as well where you give them all of your, your airline information and they can pull and aggregate all these rewards together for you. 
the, the ingenious thing, and you know, bad actors always seem to be about 25 steps ahead of us, is bad actors are realizing they can take these aggregators, dump their list of a thousand usernames and password into the aggregator, and let the aggregator ATO the bank mm -hmm. or aggregate or ATO the e-com. It's brilliant. And and the thing is, most e-coms and most banks have these aggregators whitelisted. So they have a clear path in to do all the testing they want. Very difficult to identify. I guess, you know, from, from the, the, the panel here, I guess, are you seeing anything like this? Are you seeing any unusual tactics like this that start to go outside of the, uh, the, the norm of, of what we traditionally think of as credential testing in ATO? <laughs> oh, open up. Oh, open it up. Yeah, it seems. Yeah. So um, I think you're, it's, it's a, an incredibly challenging area, obviously. And we, and we do treat aggregators. There are uh, aggregators that are valid. I mean, the customers want to use um, Venmo. They want to use Yodly or they want to use Mint. Mm -hmm. So um, that's fine. And we just need to make sure that they have a, a trusted and secure route in. Uh, and then we have to be able to ensure that every other, you know, space on the on the the beach is protected yep. <laughs> and that's 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 the tr that's the tricky part um uh yeah i i i guess your question was are we seeing aggregators misuse or are you seeing the same identity? sorts of things are you seeing any other kind of tactics that are kind of you know those those things kind of coming from left field that are that are, that are a little unusual probably yeah <laughs> <laughs> probably okay. most definitely i i you know I'm not on the okay. security operations <laughs> yeah. center all yeah. the time, but I'm definitely, I'm, sh I'm sure we are. You okay. know, from our perspective, uh, it's when uh, the pattern we see is when one of our clients is, we, we can find out when they are under ATO, under bot attack, somebody's doing credential stuffing. We see a similar pattern with other clients as well. So we see that we are on the receiving side of it yes. at times, <laughs> yeah. right? So not only are we providing services for our clients to fight for the ATO, but we get, we get to bear the brunt of it too. No, and, and, and that's uh, that's always the issue, kind of bringing it in. I guess uh, the so other just, oh. you know, one one additional thing that we've seen is you, know, you might have uh, protected your your website or your you know, whatever with with a number of different uh, third party <laughs> providers, and so rather than going after your your account, you know, your your website itself, they actually attack one of these third party providers. So basically taking that service down. So you know, maybe suddenly a site's device fingerprint is now no longer um, effective, and so you know, by by taking out one of those suppliers, it actually has a, a knock-on effect on the, the whole service. Great. So I, I guess it would also be interesting to know, you know, if, 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 if everyone in the room can take one or two things away of, you know, if e either if you currently have an account takeover problem and you're looking to solve it, or you might not even be looking at account takeover right now, what are a couple simple things? You know, obviously from the vendor perspective, come by our tools, we're happy to sell them to you. But what, what are some simple things that, that everyone in the room can do today that don't require them to go out and buy a new tool or, or don't require a large spend to actually kind of create some value around uh, starting to mitigate this? So, um, you know, I, I, so in terms of um, percentages, our our first party fraud where where uh, ATO occurs and users' um, uh, identities are are compromised far outweighs our third party, which is mobile wallet and th those kinds of um, interactions. So if, if I'm only going to focus on one area, I'd say let's focus on first party. And the question I asked to the folks before I, you know, I asked, uh, kind of did a you know, poll, uh, series of meetings with various people in the organization, and I asked them what would it be like, what would, world, what would the world be like if we no longer expected a username and password? And, you know, they, they said, well, I don't know, can we really do that? And I said, yeah, we can. And, and I think that's, that's, to me, is the simple answer. Let's, we have to change our tactics. Okay. I started by saying this, this form of authentication has been, has been present for, for decades. Mm -hmm. And we've got we've to start, we have to defend differently. Absolutely. Yeah, I just kind of mirror your same comments, Kim. We're actually in that position right now is, you know, we want to move away from the traditional username and password theory, move to some other kind of authentication for the profile. It's just a matter of, you know, making sure that internally does that strategy align with your with your marketing department and your, your data security department saying, are we all together in this? Um, but yeah, definitely it's, right. it's going to take a change of mindset from a traditional retailer perspective. So, so one thing about coming to Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., I'm quite encouraged by uh, – yeah, the, the various movements that have been taking place, particularly the one over the weekend, and I'm thinking that there seems to, it seems like we're the, the uh, um, 
time is ripe for change, right? And you know, various things are happening in, a, everywhere. And if, if, if what it takes is a hashtag or something <laughs> to get people to start thinking about doing something differently in the authentication space, yeah. then I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I think one kind of easy thing that can be done within an organization is if you already have set up some kind of two-factor authentication, you know, being either a mobile app or you know, another method, is to actually just drive the, the consumers to use that, that mobile app. So you, you, it's, it's, it's going to be the securest method. And so if you can make sure that you might be presenting options, but you know, if it's a reposition of the, the site to, to you know, encourage people to pick that up, then I'd say that's, that's something that can have a really good impact on the the authentication. Um, I think um, there's no silver bullet, sure. right? Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that. Um, having a layered approach is, you know, the, uh, the way to go. And what we have seen within uh, with our clients is um, some organize, if you combine all the various departments uh, at the client, they all are using all the solutions that are needed to build yeah. a good ATO solution. So it's all about consolidation. Um, doing, um, you know, if you're using um, device ID, you know, some other department is using the mobile ID, combine the mobile ID into your solution, right? Doing, having simple checks as doing name, address, phone verification. Um, you know, a lot of our clients have that capability, it's just not across the organization. One channel takes, one channel does it, but the other channel is not doing it. So one simple use would be, you know, taking a stock of all the vendors and capabilities that have been built into the organization and use it across. Absolutely. And I guess one thing that, that I would add to kind of take away, if you are looking to understand, do I have an ATO issue, do I have a credential testing issue, and how you can start to build an ROI, start to build a, a case to, to be able to bring in various different tools, is as simple as looking at your failed logins and looking at accounts that don't exist. So a lot of times within the, the space, we look at the accounts that were successfully authenticated. We look at the accounts that had, were a valid account that had a failed password, but are you looking at the accounts that are attempting to authenticate that don't exist in your environment? Quite often, uh, we'll see that uh, on average, between 30 to 50% of the accounts trying to log in are not actually accounts in your environment. A great sign that there's a huge account takeover testing problem there. And since you, if, if at that case point, you don't really have a lot of tools in place, it's some very easy link searching, going off of simple things like IP address, um, link searching off of the, the usernames to start to see how that, that's built out. But starts to give you really a really clear insight into do I have an issue or does everything appear to be relatively okay from a kind of a macro standpoint. You know, we, we have about eight minutes left. I think it'd be great to, to open it up to the room for some additional questions. So I think we talked about, uh, you know, creating the behavioral analytics and passive biometrics for our vendors and customers. Um, on the flip side, what information is available on the fraudster side of it? Have we done the study, behavioral analytics, people who are doing fraud stuff? And is there an opportunity to share that information across the board so that you know other team can learn and you know maybe add more security features? So is this a concept that you guys have in your head that you want to do behavioral analytics for the fraudsters? So, so when you're saying doing behavioral analytics for the fraudsters, are you meaning more around kind of web threat intel or doing behavioral analytics around the bad actors on your website? The bad actors on your website. Okay. I, 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 can, I can open this up. So the question was, are, 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 are we doing behavioral analytics around the bad actors looking at what the bad actors interact like? That is one of the things that, that at least new data does. We, we look to build populations of user behavior, um, populations within the individual user, populations within your valid user, then populations of risk. And by creating these various populations of behavior, we're able to very easily start to segment this out. So you can say, we know this 98% of logins are valid. Let's just shift them out of the way. We don't have to worry about it. Now we have this 2% of logins that are iffy. We can now start to analyze why is this 2% existing like this, and what is creating that subpopulation of risk within that? I'd open it up to the, I guess, the rest of the panel to kind of give your thoughts a little bit. Um, kind, of, kind of what we're doing is you, you kind of have to have feedback. So, I mean, for instance, like New Day may be score, doing a risk assessment on a particular login, um, and if it turns out to be fraud on our, on our, on our end, on the retailer side, we got to be able to communicate that back so they can do those okay. analytics. So they have to have that constant feedback loop saying, hey, this login or this transaction was fraudulent. Can you go back and learn from that from that experience and the interaction, what made, your, what made it fraudulent or is there any kind of key features that you can pick up on so you can continually enhance the model? Yeah. There, there are uh, 
folks that represent companies that have con kind of a consortium view of what is happening in the industry. And to your point, feeding back and helping them become smarter about fighting fraud is, is, is in practice. Great. Thank you. Another question here? Does anyone know what percentage of legitimate password changes are done via forgotten password versus someone actually using a real a live password to then go in and change their password? So, so the question was, do we know the percentages of people going through the change password functionality versus actually logging in and changing your password once you're in the account? Um, I could find those numbers. I, I don't have them off the top of my head, though. I don't know if anyone else on the panel. I, I, I'd prefer not to fight that battle. The view I take is that um, you should never have to use a password. <laughs> and and the day you ask for one is the day we basically say you know prove who you are and then you forget using your password for the next twelve months. That's fine with me. Uh, that we can go we can go that route. So I think one interest, interesting statistic that we um, you know, kind of came across last year working with a online retailer around Black Friday is that they had uh, one and a half million authentication requests from. A, a bad actor um, you know, using compromised credentials that they found. And of those, 300,000 would have been successful if there wasn't the additional analytics in place. It just shows the kind of, you know, everyone says, oh, people reuse uh, you know, credentials, but that's just you know, putting it into, into numbers there. And, and I think you'll, you'll see, it's, it's really that idea of contextualizing what the behavior is doing and that kind of idea of continuous verification. So, you know, the, the user maybe resets their password up front. They reset their password after they logged in. Well, what do they do next? Do they go directly in, a, in an FI world? Do they go directly to add a new beneficiary and transfer a large amount of money out? That's contextually risky. Do they change the password and then not really do anything? But then you want to have that contextualization that the password was changed within the last session, so sessions downstream can also take that reference to understand if other risk events occur within that as well. So you know, I, I'd say that you know, users are unusual. Um, I'm sure we all know that, that, that your best users are probably acting very strange, and the fraudsters have probably act really normal. So it's, it's trying to understand what is what and trying to create that contextualization throughout that entire web experience or the, the mobile experience. A any other questions? Great. So I guess we, we have just a, a few minutes left, so I, I just leave it to the panel for any closing thoughts you might have. We'll you know, maybe start at the, start yes. at the end. So I suppose what, one, one thing that everyone can do here to actually protect themselves is you know, another thing that we've seen is you know, when you go to buy a property, you're going to be transferring a lot of money to a solicitor's account. Now just make sure that that solicitor has given you the, the right account to transfer it to. Maybe that's the time to actually go and visit them in person. <laughs> Anything uh, from? No, I think we covered everything. Okay. Anything uh, from you guys? You don't have to have a closing remark. I just gave you the option, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about a lot of different strategies here. I mean, from, from my perspective is, I mean, I think a multi-layered approach is the biggest thing that, that you can do is because, you know, not, there's it's no silver bullet to fight fraud or even ATO. So we do a lot for uh, strategies to to determine what the automated or non-human attacks are going to be and what that friction looks like to kind of deter that traffic um, somewhere else. But there are times where fraud and ATO does happen and does get through that. So you have to have a backup plan say, okay, now that they've gotten through, what's my human friction experience going to look like from a known fraudster? So it's just, just keep that in mind as you kind of look at your, what you're combating ATO is what's my multi-layered approach going to be? Yeah, I just say, you know, up your game, start thinking differently. Um, faster payments is around the corner. We, you know, we're going to start moving money at, at, at you know, light speed. So we all have to be much better about uh, um, detecting fraud and preventing it. Oh, great. Well, thank you to everyone on the panel today. I appreciate your time, and thank you to everyone as well.